Hello everyone out there in podcast land. Welcome back to another episode of Adventure Capital, where we discuss the entrepreneurial journeys and adventures with founders who have raised capital on WeFunder. Huzzah! Today we have Lloyd Armbrus, CEO of Armbrus American, who's bringing manufacturing back to America, starting with surgical and N95 masks to fight COVID. You go ahead, Lloyd. We funder gang gang, take it away. Lloyd, uh, thanks so much for, for being here, man. Good to have you on the podcast. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, maybe you can start by giving us an overview of uh, your career. Uh, who is Lloyd Armbrust um, and kind of, you know, ending up with what you're up to um, today? Wow, great. I mean, uh, I hope you got a lot of time on your hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my career is varied and sundry. Um, I, yeah, I think kind of to understand how, how I got to the place that I'm at now, I would, I would, I would start talking about... Um, the probably the person that influenced me the most, which is my dad. Um, I think a lot of us grew up, you know, idolizing our parents in one way or the other. Uh, my dad was a plant manager um, in uh, Duluth, Minnesota, and uh, he was he was a lot older. I grew, I think when I was born, I think he was probably fifty two or fifty three. So it was really interesting having like a much older father. Um, and he uh, he had actually he was in the he was in the war and he had come back. Uh, and, and during the war, uh, you know, the, the town that I grew up in Duluth, Minnesota had about 250,000 people in it. Um, and so of course he got into manufacturing and production, uh, as pretty much everyone did, um, around that time. By the time I left Duluth, when I was, uh, 18, 19 years old, there were about 65,000 people in that town. So that just shows wow. you how much it had shrank. Yeah. And, and what and, time frame was that? That's I'm, I'm inadvertently question. asking you how old you are. Uh, sorry about that. It's very weird. No, um, no, I'm, I'm almost, I turned 40 this year. So I'm trying to be as successful as possible. So I don't feel so bad about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah. That so seventies and eighties, basically, basically I, yeah, I grew up in, uh, uh 1981, uh, was when I was born in Duluth, Minnesota. Um, but the, you know, my dad was there, um, and when it, the town was much bigger, um, that would have been, you know, probably 34 years before that. And, um, it just, there was a, there's just a massive decline in, in, in manufacturing and in production. Duluth is interesting because it sits, um, on the world's largest freshwater lake, but it's also, uh, Lake Superior, but it's also the world's largest inland port. Um, and the reason why that was strategically important was because you could just, you could get ships, which is a very efficient way of, of moving material, all the way in to the interior of the United States. Um, and so that's why it was a very popular place, especially during, you know, World War II and, and other conflicts afterwards. And, you know, just the production started going over to other countries. Um, it just became more efficient to do so as the labor there was just much cheaper. Just It just became for those reasons. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm all for efficiency and I, I have nothing against like an interconnected world, I think, in a way that brings prosperity to everyone. And that's a good thing. But I think there is the question of at what cost, like, did we go too far? And I think in the, you know, the 2020, 2019 pandemic, um, we, mm -hmm. we really saw how far that could go. And I think a lot of us, I was just having a conversation today with one of our WeFunder investors, actually, who came by the factory. Cause one of the, uh, one of the things that we do is, as a, as a perk is if you invest a certain amount, you can come actually oh, visit cool. the factory. That's yeah. Cool. And it's really cool to meet a lot of these folks and hear their story and hear why they invested. Mm -hmm. uh, so actually that perk has helped me uh, in, in many ways um, mm -hmm. more than I think the folks who are coming to visit. Um, but this guy that I was talking to, he, he works in e-commerce. He was telling me, you know, Lloyd, it's insane how crazy things have gotten when, uh, we, dur during the last like six months, we couldn't keep pools, like the, not in ground pools, but uh, the, the like inflatable pools. We couldn't keep pools in stock because the supply chain for pools, inflatable, like kid kids' pools, right, has been disrupted. <laughs> like we can't get children's pools. And he said, I have bots scraping my site, uh, finding out the moment that we put these pools online and then they buy them. And, uh, and, and they sell and we sell out instantly. 
And that's just an example of like how like these sort of like interconnected, this interconnected world that's, it's really impossible to map everything. I mean, the Suez um, Canal is an interesting uh, example <laughs> exactly. of uh, supply chain fragility as well in recent weeks. But so exactly. then kind of so segue that then into to Armrust, American. Yeah. So so I left when I left Duluth, Minnesota, um, I, uh, you know, there was no manufacturing jobs to have. So I, I actually got into the manufacturing of my day, which was software. I started a software company um, in 2010. I, I got into Y Combinator. Um, we raised about $10 million. And it was in 2019 that I'd taken that company and had run it for about nine years. And I decided that I was going to uh, to buy back that company for my investors. Cause we got that company to about $11 million in revenue, but it just wasn't going to be, you know, a VC exit, which, right. you know, I know you want to talk about capital. Like this is something I feel very strongly about um, the VCs that were involved. Like it just didn't make sense for them to have a business that was very profitable and a very right. good business, <laughs> but to keep that going, it's not interesting for them. So I a- did a lot of work. Yes, exactly. Yeah. There's a lot of businesses that are great businesses. They just shouldn't be billion dollar businesses. And the problem with VC, it's they're built for billion dollar exits only. And actually like my wife um, just went through Y Combinator with her company and she just raised $2 million uh, on, on a 20 million valuation, which is insanely awesome uh, for her to do. But when you do the math, that investor needs her to exit for two billion dollars. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. that's insane. So that kind of that's insane, and that's and that's this round. Certain routes yeah. and compels you to do exactly. certain things, like spend a lot of money on Facebook and Google ads, and it feeds that's feeds right. the machine. Just as an aside, I, are you and your wife yeah. the first couple to <laughs> have different startups go through Y Combinator? I think maybe um, we haven't really broadcast that. I don't think she's officially announced, but I'm sure by the time that this that comes out, it won't. That be a scoop for the uh, We Funder a Venture Capital <laughs> podcast. <laughs> that, that's right. That'll Speaking be your scoop. News. Yeah. So, so, uh, so when you said yeah. before, like you're, you're passionate about the, the capital piece, is that what you're passionate about? Like trying to break this like crazy uh, dichotomy or like kind of forge the middle ground between like, you know, billion dollar TAM venture capital and like bank debt? It's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that like it's just um, I just I dislike business models that are trying to take a round peg and put it in a square hole. And I think that's really just like there's a right move for for different businesses. And I think with VC, I think if you go with the Y Combinator, every investor you talk to is going to convince you that you need to raise. Um, that kind of money. And, you know, my wife's business actually is a, like a multi-billion dollar opportunity. She's focusing on the future of work. So I, I think for her, it made, it did make sense. And she went into it knowing that that made sense. But I think for my last company, um, which yeah, was essentially a like a software, yeah, it, it, it just was, it, it didn't make any sense. And so what, and so that, that's what I, I really think is important is like, like really you know, using the right tool for the right situation. I think that applies to, you know, more than just capital. I think that's just a general thing in life for me. So then, so give us an overview then on Armrust American and then, and then kind of how did you raise money on WeFunder for the company? So what it was, it was interesting timing because um, I, in early 2020, I had just, I basically, I got to this point with, with the venture and, you know, my investors all awesome. Like it's amazing folks. There was, never really any like real pressure, but it's like, these guys give you millions of dollars. That enough was pressure for me to say like, I need to give these guys an exit. And so um, I was able to basically take the company private by, um, by raising bank debt um, and, uh, and doing what's called a leverage buyout. And so I had just done that. um, And my investors had gotten an exit and it was a company that like, you know, again, we had thought was going to be much bigger, um, but I kind of did the right thing. Or, or as you know, some, I think a cut at the end, maybe broke even, um, but everyone was pretty happy with that. And so um, this was right when the pandemic was hitting. And I remember uh, Sam Altman, who at one point was running YC, he, he uh, was looking at this problem of the fact that we couldn't get masks, um, that, uh, that, that the United States couldn't get masks for our doctors and nurses. And he said, this is a stupid problem to have. I know the solution is let's buy a bunch of masks from China. And I'm like, that's the dumbest thing. That's like, mm-hmm. look at the actual source of the problem. Not like, you know, which is the fact that we just can't make our own supply here. Like, look, like right. eggs, 
and, you know, meat and other things, maybe like those shouldn't be made in China. Like maybe just some things should be made locally and that's okay. And I think PPE is one of those things. And so he put together this billion mass project, which I'm kind of like making fun of him a little bit, but it did anger me at the time because I'm like, we're just thinking about the wrong things. He said, we're going to buy a billion masks for 35 cents each. That's $350 million that he was looking to raise mm -hmm. to buy these masks. And I'm like, guys, for, for way less than that. And I actually calculate, I'm pretty good at business models. So I actually, because of that, put together a business model. And I was like, I'm pretty sure for $5 million, I can create the capability of making a billion masks a year. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, sort of like teach a man to fish versus uh, just mm -hmm. feeding them. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I, I was, I, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and do this. I, I remember I tweeted like in February or, 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 or uh, maybe it was January, something like, do you think this is a terrible idea to buy, spend a couple hundred thousand dollars on a mask machine and bring it into the United States? <laughs> and everyone like responded to me on Twitter. Yes, this is a terrible idea. Um, and, and so I was like, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it just myself. Right. And so I, d I put the money together, a couple hundred thousand dollars for the first machine to got it going. And then I was talking to some of my investors just casually. Cause they're kind of, some of them are friends. And I was telling about the model I'd put together in the Sam Altman thing. And they were like, show me this model. And so I showed it to them and they're like, Hey, this is really interesting. And they're like, let's, let's work on this. And so one of the investors, um, who's here in Austin, I kind of worked with him for probably a few, a few days, uh, his name's Bill Babel. Um, and, uh, we, we kind of iterated on it and it was literally, it was over a weekend. I sent out the information to a bunch of investors and we ended up raising about $5 million in a weekend, um, mm -hmm. just based on this. And it was all, it was like the right combination of like, you know, investors who, you know, trusted me because I had, you know, get, given them, like I, I stuck with something and they knew that I wasn't going to give up. Um, and also we're very interested in this problem because I think mm -hmm. a lot of us were sitting around going like, seriously, we can't just make some of these masks. This is a dumb problem to have. We are America. This is a dumb problem for America to have. So why did you decide you raised $5 million, as you say, what, why did you decide to um, do part of that uh, through a regulation crowdfunding campaign on WeFunder? That's a great question. Um, a, a lot of people were asking that very same thing. And we found her like, it seems like you're profitable, which, you know, we are, um, we have a, a good business. Uh, I tend to build businesses so that they're not necessarily the venture model, which is to burn as much money as possible, but to be making money when we spend advertising, uh, for advertising, as an example, we mm -hmm. have at least a one X, uh, ROAS return on ad spend. Mm -hmm. Um, but typically we're three to four X. So we want to be making money. Everything is about making money, especially in manufacturing when right. you have to just hold on to so much, uh, raw materials and inventory and things like that. So a lot of people ask that, why, why do you want to raise money? Like, well, we have developed over the course of the last year, hundreds of thousands of super loyal customers. And I, I have been blown away by the amount of people who have resonated with our vision, resonated with um, what we're trying to do, bring strategic manufacturing back to the United States. And mm. I said, you know, and, and we, and by the way, we had people who were like, I, I share this with my friends and my grandma. And I like to, to bring this to my church. And I like mm. buying for all these people. I remember, you know, Johnny, I remember this is a crazy story. We were very early on. It was only about a month or two in. And I looked in, um, I looked in my Shopify store and I just sorted by one day the highest, like the, the, the high, basically who had spent the most money. Mm -hmm. And it was this local person. Um, and uh, she had spent like a couple thousand dollars on masks. And I'm like, what is going on here? Mm -hmm. I'm like, this is very weird. Right. And so I actually reached out to her. I, I called her and I was like, Hey, you're in Austin. We're in Austin. Why are you buying so many masks? <laughs> and she's like, I'm giving them away. She's like, I, she's like, I'm a nurse. Uh, my husband's a nurse. And uh, we, we bring them to our office. We give them to other nurses. We, uh, wow. you know, we give them to friends. We give them to neighbors. And I'm like, wow. I'm like, well, why, why are you doing that? And they're like, well, number one, they're really great masks. I love your masks. I think they're better than anything else. But the most important thing is we could not get these things. And it was because China was taking them. They were not letting them out of the, I mean, they were literally, I don't know if you know this, but um, 3M owns these factories, obviously in China, right? They're the largest producer in the world. 
And what was happening was the Chinese government was literally standing at the end of their production line, seizing masks as they came off. Wow. And they were doing that. And it's hard to blame them, right? Because I, the U.S. government is kind of doing the same thing, to be honest. They, they won't let us export our masks, as an example. Um, so they're kind of doing the same thing. Um, but they were doing that um, because they wanted to protect their own people, right? You can't really blame them for that. But at the same time, it's like, that's why we need to have this here. And that's what that nurse said. And that's what so many people, I mean, look at our, go to our website, armbrustusa.com, and you're going to see right away, I think uh, 8,800 like five-star reviews, not the other reviews, just the five-star reviews. And if you can scroll through all of those and they're all just like people who understand what we're trying to do here. So is that it, why you wanted to raise money like from your customers? Because you saw like, oh, this is going to, you know, make people even more loyal customers and, and kind of excited like ambassadors for what we're doing, like write us a five-star review is, is kind of to the question on like why raise this money from the crowd on WeFunder, is that kind of what was feeding into your thinking? Absolutely. I think I'm a, a little bit unique, maybe for a lot of the WeFunder type companies that comes in when, you know, I have a lot of experience raising money and I have a lot of connections. Right. Um, we could have raised a lot more. Um, we and we haven't even a lot of money outside the platform, right? Yes, we did. We raised that the first 5 million and um, we're probably going to end up doing a much, much larger round here. Um, in the, uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. um, but the whole point was exactly, as you said, it was to give people access to be a part of what we're building. Well, you know, with uh, 5 million caps now, Lloyd, and uh, Regulation A uh, now increasing the max up to 75 million. Let's talk about that next round. <laughs> um, but, uh, okay, what, one kind of related question. Um, uh, as you say, you've, you've raised money before, you went through YC, uh, mm -hmm. You've seen your your wife raising money now for her startup. Um, WeFunder is is a relatively new way of uh, founders raising capital. It's been Reg C has been legal now for five years. We've just increased the cap to five million. How do you see the growth of regulation crowdfunding uh, over the coming years? Or like what what trends do you see in you know kind of early stage um, cap capital raising? Um, as someone that's kind of been in this space for a decade now, maybe more. So w one of the things that I don't know if I, you guys sh certainly don't share enough of, I think is the fact that you guys actually were the founders of WeFunder were the, were the pioneers in the space. They were the ones that actually wrote the, the, the original crowdfunding mm -hmm. laws exactly. to make yeah. this possible. And that is so cool. I think you guys are literally on the bleeding edge of it and you're on the bleeding edge of this, of this next, uh, uh, expansion that they're doing. And I think it's really great. I think what the internet does, like if you, if you want to be really generic and you want to know why things are happening and why things are being disrupted the way they are is because the internet eliminates middlemen. That's what it does. It eliminates middlemen. And you saw that with music, right? It used to be used to have these record big right. record deals if you wanted to get out there. And it was just literally, it was very, very hard to get your music in front of that many people, right? And so you had to have a record deal. Now you can get on Spotify. And if you get uh, you know, noticed by one of the, the DJs yeah. on Spotify, you will get promoted and it's it's very organic. And but what's cool is that like you can actually be a musician on YouTube and Spotify, and you can make enough money to make a good living from a thousand fans mm -hmm. all over the internet. And right. we were talking about a world of like billions of people. Getting a thousand fans is actually not that hard. And so that's why I think the internet is really cool is because it's, it's, it's eliminating those middlemen and it hasn't really happened to the capital markets yet, but you see a lot of these changes happening, right? You see with uh, wall street wall bets, street you bets. see yeah. taking down some of these hedge funds, you see all these like interesting things happening. What's happening is these markets and, and, and VC is, is no different is right. an, are now for the first time being disrupted. I went, when I went through Y Combinator, it was in 2010. And I remember, I think it was um, that the, the founding partner of Sequoia talked to us and he was talking about the Google investment. And in and, and my round, YC now, by the way, has about 250. I think this last round had 350 startups. Okay. When, when I went through, there was 26. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very small room. And it was, you know, these super legitimate people that were coming and talking to us. And when, when he talked to us, he was like, you know, What's interesting is that like, there are only 
300 VCs in the entire world. This was true in 2010. He's like, wow. that means that like, if you met one every day, you mm-hmm. could meet every VC that exists in yeah, less yeah. than a year. He's like, that's not that many, right? Um, that has changed. <laughs> now there's thousands and tens of thousands of VCs and funds and micro funds and all these things. So that disruption is happening to a certain degree, but nothing is like what we funder is doing. Nothing is like what crowdfunding yeah. has the capability. It's democracy, right? Like, you know, Twitter is democracy applied to journalism. Airbnb is democracy applied to hotels. And um, yeah, right. this, is, uh, this is democracy applied to angel investing um, and early stage investing. Um, and um, yeah, it's fun to be disrupting uh, VCs, right? Because <laughs> it's like, you know, they, they've kind of gleefully disrupted every industry. And, and, <laughs> and, and we funder is not like anti, anti-VC no. by any means, right? But it's like, you know, this is now the disruption of venture capital and early stage investing, and it's it's kind of it's kind of fun. It's uh, it'll be interesting to see if uh, that disruption is embraced with as much uh, uh, glee uh, as uh, disruption of every under, other industry has been over the last few decades. Um, what well, well, you know what's uh, what's interesting about that disruption though is it actually improves both sides, right? Because what happens? I right. mean, look at like rec- it's not like there are no record companies anymore. It's not like there are no TV production companies, right? Yeah. Like they still exist. It's just the good ones exist, and they have to right. provide all of this Quality. value and prove themselves. And it's the same thing with VC. Like the yeah. VCs that are thriving today, like Andreessen Horowitz, yeah. like they're providing real value. Where before yeah. it was like here's money. And that's all yeah, you got. That's a great point. That's a great point. And, and obviously we hope we can provide value on the Reg CF side as well. I mean, it sounds like, as you're saying, you know, if we can recruit our founders, an army of passionate ambassadors, customers, champions, supporters, hopefully over time, our ambition is to provide just as much, if not more value than, you know, the Andreessen Horowitz of this world. We have our work cut out for it. That's us. That's a pretty big challenge, but that's the uh, the noble aim. All right, two last questions for you, Lloyd. Um, this has been very awesome, fascinating. Thanks for taking the time to do this. A uh, couple of quick questions. One, one piece of advice uh, for someone running a WeFunder campaign, and then two, more generically, a piece of advice for someone starting a startup, maybe in the manufacturing sector. Oh, uh, that's, a, that's a good one. Um, so I... For we funder, I think that like or or fundraising in general, like fundraising in general, um, is really about two things. When you're talking to an investor, um, what you have to do is you have to decrease an investor's fear that you're going to lose their money, and you have to increase their greed that they're going to lose out on this deal. If you can do two those two things, and you can see that you know decreasing the fear increasing the greed you're providing this like gap of where they want to actually invest that works with an individual investor like a small like person who's given a hundred bucks um to an investor who's giving you know millions of dollars like they want to decrease their fear that you're going to lose their money and increase your- and i'll tell you one quick anecdote where i, where I learned this was mm-hmm. um Paul Bukite is the founder of, he basically started Gmail. He's one of the smartest guys I've ever met. Um, And uh, he was around a lot in the early days of Y Combinator. He joined later as as a partner, but wasn't there when, wasn't a partner when we were there. And uh, I remember hounding him to try to invest in my company. And it was literally like, I would just ask him every day. I mean, it was just being super annoying. And I would say stupid stuff too. Like, I'd be like, oh, you have two kids. I have two kids. You should invest in my company. Like literally it was like, (laughs) it was becoming a joke to me. And one day he was like, all right, come. And he just sold his company to to Facebook um, for like $50 million. So he's like, all right, come by Facebook and come check this out. Uh, We'll, we'll go look at this. And he, he like, he, he beats me up on how bad the product is and how shitty it is and all that stuff. And he, he finally, he's like, and I'm like, yes, yes, Paul, this is all true. But the question is like, not why, 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 uh, why is it as a plumber investing in, you know, $50 a month in this platform that as you point out is a piece of shit technology that's breaking all the time. Mm-hmm. But it's, the answer is that they don't have any other choice because they don't have any other place to go. And he like laughs because he knows it's true. And he says, all right, I'll invest, but don't lose my money. Okay. <laughs> and that encapsulates the entire thing. Like he was like, 
he, I, de- I increased his greed and I decreased his fear enough. But then that fear came back a little bit. It was like, okay, don't lose, don't lose my money. Okay. And he was our first check-in and we, we didn't, we didn't lose his money. And so I, I think that in, in general is, is really important. Um, and just figuring, like, put yourself in the investor's shoes, right? Like get in front of them, get in front of as many people as possible. Talk to your, you know, your mom, your cat, your dog, uh, talk to random people in line at Starbucks. I used to do that, like buy them a coffee to like, let me pitch them until it like is just a no brainer. And, and that's what you have to do. Uh, if you want to be able to sell this stuff to people, because that's what it is. It's a sale. That's an awesome, uh, very, very simple framework, uh, reduce fear, uh, and risk increase greed. Okay. One last piece of advice. Someone starting a manufacturing, uh, startup in America. Oh man, that's, that's a tough one. I think that, um, it depends, really depends on your background. Um, the biggest thing that I probably learned, um, was that you just need to trust your gut because I went through a lot of folks who were promising me a lot of things and were saying that they understood things. And then, not knowing some of the mechanical stuff, I would dig into it. I mean, I'm not a mechanical engineer. Um, I would dig into it and I, w- I would just try random stuff and it would start working. And I'm like, wait, if I'm figuring this out and this person's not figuring out, maybe they're not good. But then I'm like, well, I don't really know this space. So I'm going to defer, mm-hmm. defer, defer. And um, that's the biggest thing. And I had to learn that in software too, because I'm not a like a software engineer either. And I did the same thing. So I think I had a, I have a hard time uh, trusting my gut on something, but just like, if it's not sitting right with you, like as, as you're trying to progress things forward, like it's probably, there's probably something off. Mm -hmm. Just trust your gut. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, man. Uh, this has been, uh, great. Thanks so much for taking the time to do this and, um, yeah, we'll speak to you soon. All right. Thanks so much, man. All right. Cheers. Bye. Thank you for tuning into another episode of adventure capital. I hope you laugh took notes shed a tear and most importantly feel ready to go off on your own adventure and remember whenever you are ready we funder is here to help <laughs>